It's really nice to sit. Thank you so much. Maybe it's all the years of uh, working on my feet, or maybe it's just being a man of a certain age, you know? I like to toast to sitting. Cheers. Now, the, uh, the history of toasting takes us back to when glasses were goblets, and when uh, very important people, landowners, land barons, people would get together for a, a large feast. They would uh, take their glasses and smash them together after a proclamation of friendship and of good health, so the liquid would slosh from one glass into the other. And, and taking the first sip was a sign that the, that the drink was not poisoned. You know, uh, as history unfolded, this tradition was adapted in various pockets of the world, uh, more lessons for the learning. And tonight, I'm drinking vermouth. Vermouth is an aromatized and fortified wine. It is a wine that has been fortified, meaning sugar has been added to bring the alcohol levels up, usually leaving behind a little bit of sweetness. And then it is aromatized with a bunch of different things, uh, flowers, seeds, bark, spices, a proprietary blend of any and all of it. Vermouth is delicious. Vermouth, I think, is for sitting and for reflecting. Vermouth is for getting older. And for realizing the things that we once thought were normal now seem odd. And uh, the things that used to be freaky deaky no longer seem so strange. Tonight's delivery will be in three toasts with three different vermouths. Our first vermouth takes us to Italy. Quando, quando, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> I am 25 years old. I am dirt broke. I'm doing the New York hustle. And a friend of mine, a former teacher of mine in college, but now a friend, uh, emails a small circle of people. Renting a cottage in Rome, extra bedroom. If you can fly yourself out, email me back and book your week. Now listen, just between us neighbors, I am not strictly speaking Italian. I know that may be confusing for you, but uh, there was something that transcended genetic makeup that was drawing me to Rome, and here was my opportunity. I scrape together the cash, and I fly out, and Holy shit. I spend my first few days in pure awe, amazed at the chaos of Rome. Very different than the chaos of New York, by the way. Uh, it's a slower type of chaos. One could call it a mess. <laughs> but uh, somehow everything just works. There are these uh, little tiny streets in Trastevere uh, where we stayed. Um, and there's no such thing as sidewalks, you know, but there's just people and cars and bikes and mopeds, and there are no lines. But Everybody just shares, and it just works, and it's beautiful. And there are buildings all around you, crumbling and stunning, and they're painted and fainted uh, in faded pinks and oranges. And then the most gorgeous person in the world just casually walks by wearing the most beautiful suit or gown. And the most delicious cappuccino in the world can be found in any corner cafe covered in hazy cigarette smoke. And uh, vegetable stands uh, sell tomatoes and make you realize you've never actually eaten a tomato before that very moment. You've just had watery, flimsy suggestions of tomatoes. And uh, <laughs> you get a gelato when you walk past uh, a crumbling 13th century church that's under construction with security guards outside that are so beautiful they can be international models, but you know, they want to stay close to home because nothing compares to mama's pasta. <laughs> and my friend and I one afternoon go to see the gnocchi lady because we're going to get gnocchi for dinner. And, uh, she scoops the gnocchi with her bare hand. She puts it in the brown paper bag. We hand her the money, and that's when she puts on the glove, because, hello, <laughs> food is the clean thing, money is the dirty thing, and lunches are three hours affairs with fucking grandma and grandpa and baby bambinos, and there's crafts of wine, because there is no such thing as a 30-minute unpaid lunch break. The Romans know not of a desk salad, and it's a life that just speaks to the very core of me, even though I've never been there before. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> Towards the end of uh, my week, my friend and I cross the River Tiber, and we walk up the steps of a stunning basilicata to get a better view of Rome. And um, my friend is telling me about the history of this particular neighborhood, and we sit on the steps, and I uh, reach into my bag for a bottle of water, and he says, will you just stop moving? Can you just sit still? <laughs> I remember this moment vividly. It had been a while since I was last chastised for my exuberance. He was older, yes, so he had been in Rome for a few weeks longer. Was I bringing an unintentional desk salad energy to the mix? <laughs> was the hustle of New York City still coursing through my veins, even though I was enamored with the slowness all around me? Instead of being offended, I decided to interpret that moment as a challenge. 
Could I slow down? Could I be still? Could I just sit? The rest of the trip was lovely. Um, I thanked my friend. I flew back to New York, back to the chaos and the speed, now noticed with new eyes. And um, this was early in my bartending days. Um, and this vermouth, the Carpano Antica Formula, was one of the first vermouths I began to play around with. It is, it's Italian, of course. Some people say this is based off the very first vermouth recipe from the 1700s. It's delicious. Uh, it is a little sweet, though. It's a little young in its optimism, in my humble opinion. Um, and when making a toast in Italy, you can say salute while raising your glass towards the center of the room, not to individuals around you. And it's also custom to, add, before you take a sip, to uh, tap the bottom uh, of the glass on a table. Some people say that tradition is a, is a thank you gesture, uh, thanking all the, um, the hard work of the innkeepers and the tavern owners. So I'd like to raise a glass to the boundless energy of our youth. Enjoy it while you still got it. Salute. Our second vermouth takes us to Japan. I am a couple years older now. I'm like 32 at this point. I fly out with my husband, uh, Chiaki, during our first year of marriage. Japan is his home country, and um, he's right over there. And um, uh, we're, I'm going to fly back to meet his family. And uh, it's a very long flight. A man of my size does not sleep well in economy. So by the time we land, I'm a little, I'm a little, uh, a little bit tired. And we struggle to stay awake that first night to meet his older brother when he gets off work. When he finally does, he lends us two bicycles for getting around to Tokyo. And uh, we say sleepy goodbye, hop on the bikes back to the Airbnb. And it's just past midnight as we're going through Shibuya. Shibuya is a skyscraper in a neon lit district that makes Times Square look like small town America. And I try to pull my eyes up and off the road to take it all in, but in my hazy jet lag, I can barely see what I'm doing, where I'm going, I'm just following Chiaki and his bicycle, letting him guide the way. And we spend the next week biking around Tokyo, and like Rome, but very different, I'm having a wild culinary experience, eating a piece of broiled salmon that makes me realize I've never actually had salmon before. How could that pale, pasty fish I eat in America possibly compare to this pink piece of perfection on my plate? Pork gyoza from a shop in Harajuku that's been doing it for centuries, centuries. The bottom of that gyoza pan had hundreds of years of grease baked in, God bless them. <laughs> and the simple uh, simplicity of a beef bowl over rice at a counter that caters to salary men on their lunch break for the equivalent of a couple of bucks, putting our fast food to shame. Chiaki's taking me to all the places he used to go to when he lived in Tokyo in his 20s. And, uh, and I, who am much more comfortable taking the lead on the planning of vacations, take the back seat for once. The second part of our trip, we fly to Uto, a small town outside Kumamoto, a small city in the island of Kyushu. Uto is Shiaki's hometown, where the rest of his family lives. I meet his mother, his father, his younger brother. They are wonderful, kind, and generous. And we are there for his uncle's 70th birthday. I suggest we make mini hamburgers and french fries to bring to the party, and Chiaki is down. We show up with this platter of American food and his whole family applauds. <laughs> I soon learned that I am the first, not only American, but the first non-Japanese person to come to his family's house. The rest of his family are farmers. They grow vegetables and rice. They raise livestock. Uh, the party is in this open-air pagoda on the family farm. The grill is going with barbecued meats, pork, and beef, and chicken. We sit down and we settle for the party, and it soon dawns on me that uh, my presence there is kind of a big deal. The whole family is looking at me, asking me questions in Japanese. Uh, Chiaki is translating as best and as fast as he can. And it also dawns on me that I can get quite shy in some instances, and I might only prefer attention in very specific scenarios, like me with the microphone right now. <laughs> and uh, as the party unfolds, I feel myself get a little bit self-conscious. There is sake at this party, and Chiaki's father, who does not drink, makes sure my glass never gets less than halfway full. Very good host. And as hours go on, I just try to breathe my way through my discomfort, sit, drink sake, and trust. Trust my husband, trust that everything is going to be OK. But I recognize that handing over that trust does not come naturally to someone like me. And partially because of my shyness, but also because of the generosity of my hosts, my sake glass never emptied, and I got very drunk. <laughs> towards the end of the party, the, uh, the birthday man stands up. He gives a speech in Japanese while gesturing towards me. I sat there, just uh, giving the best outward expression of being chill. And at the end of the speech, he gives me the hat off of his head as a parting gift. 
Chiaki and I leave in the car, I finally feel my shoulders begin to relax. And I asked Chiaki what his uncle said. And his uncle said um, uh, how much of an honor it was that uh, I came to the party, that he doesn't travel much. They stay close to the family, close to the farm. Uh, and what a gift it was to have someone come uh, from overseas, and what a, especially on such a momentous birthday. And, um, and this vermouth uh, is a uh, sake-based vermouth that's made with rice that comes from Kumamoto, from that very spot. Uh, it's flavored with yuzu, kaboso, and sancho peppercorn. It is wild and unfiltered. It's perfect for sitting and contemplating the sense of otherness. And uh, when drinking in Japan, try not to pour your own drink. Uh, always reciprocate when someone pours a drink for you. Uh, and you can uh, show courtesy by holding the glass with two hands when someone pours. Uh, you can say kanpai when raising a glass. And I would love to propose a toast to um, sitting as endurance, uh, to unintentional and uh, intentional gifts, and to the beauty of sitting back and letting your partner take the wheel. Kanpai. Thank you. I got one more. And our last remote takes us to Spain. Um, I have been to Spain a few times in my life, but this summer, after five years of not traveling, I turned 41 in Valencia. And this summer, my God, we ate, we vermouthed, we siested like the locals do. And on this trip, more than any other, we, we sat like the Spaniards too. They have these public squares, every town, every city, they have these public squares ringed with cafes and bars, and you can sit at any of them. You can have a bottle of water, you can have a cafe con leche, you can have a three-course meal, or you can sit and have a vermouth on the rocks. You can sit and watch the world go by, you can sit and chat with a friend, you can sit and watch the kids kick soccer balls up against the side of 600-year-old churches, you can sit and watch old people smile, young people smile, middle-aged people smile. There was this one restaurant in Valencia called Teca. We went there for lunch on our first day, and it was so good, we went back there three more times. If it's good, it's good. And um, we went there for uh, our very last meal on the last night. We show up, and the waiters all recognize us, and they're smiling, and they're shaking our hands as we take our, our, our seats. We get the very first reservation. They open up at 8 p.m. for dinner because, hello, it's Spain. And we sit on the patio, and um, God, the food. The food. I mean, just the octopus that make the other octopi seethe with jealousy. The razor clams that make you wince with the pleasure. The, the bread, the olive oil, the wine, the seafood, the, the four major Spanish food groups. <laughs> and uh, towards the end of the meal, Chiaki and I are reminiscing about our time in Spain, even though we're still there, right? It's our last night. And, uh, and the waiters bring us out two glasses of house-made vermouth. And we sip it, and it's earthy and herbaceous and wonderful, aged, refined, beautifully balanced. And we, we look around, and we realize that this restaurant, like every other restaurant we've been to, only takes one reservation per table per night. The pace of the evening is slow and comfortable. And our conversation turns to questions. How do we do this? How do we manifest this? How do we create more space for sitting, more space for watching the world go by? How do we, in the, in the US, uh, separate ourselves from the hustle so ingrained in our bodies, a hustle that over the years has somewhat lost its luster? We look around. The other tables are beginning to pay up, so we decide to finally settle up. But we clink glasses. N no answers, but we relish in having the questions. And in Spain, they have this uh, word called sobremesa, which uh, describes the time after the meal is over where everyone just sits and talks, maybe over a coffee, one last bottle of wine. It's an encouragement to linger, to not rush off, to remember what we're doing this all for. And uh, in Spain, the, the word for a toast is un brindis. And for our, our last little moment together, if you could please raise your glass. Un brindis por la sobremesa. To sitting, to lingering, to getting older, to aging like fine wine to realizing how silly the hustle is and that we had everything we needed all along right here, sitting at this table together. Cheers. <laughs>